it's still morning, it might have felt like a long morning and you've got lots of things planned this afternoon. We want to start pretty much on time so that you can get away having learnt lots and reflected lots on what the research priorities might be for regenerative agriculture. I'm chairing, my name is Elizabeth Stockdale, I'm Head of Farming Systems and Agronomy Research at NIAB. And that's about as much, apart from me pointing and conducting, that you're going to hear from me today, which is a good thing. I've got two great people with me that are going to introduce themselves. And first, Tom. Hi, I'm Tom McMillan. I work at the Royal Agriculture University and also help coordinate the Agriculture Universities Council, which brings together the universities that research and teach in agriculture. And we're co-sponsoring this, uh, this type of study with agriculture. Great. Yeah, I'm Julia Cooper. I'm head of research at the Organic Research Centre. And yeah, I'm going to uh, kick off the uh, this session today. I'm going to give a little bit of a talk on some work that I've been involved in the last six months or so with the Organic Research Centre on looking at research priorities for Regen Ag. So I'm going to talk for hopefully only about 12 minutes or so, and then Tom, and then we'll have time for questions. So really hoping to hear from people during the session on what you think about some of the priorities we've pulled out of our research in the last year or so, and uh, hopefully we'll have some good discussion at the end. So yeah, this is an intro to the project that we've been working on at Organic Research Center with Liz Stock Stockdale in collaboration. She said she wasn't going to say anything else, but she may jump in on the questions if there's anything she wants to contribute, and Belinda Clark at Agritech East. And this came out of an interest um, that was uh, expressed by the Sainsbury's family and their charitable trust that you can see the three of them named there that funded this work. You know, they do a lot of funding for research in plant science and they wanted to know more about what are the needs for Regen Ag, what do we need to be researching to really, you know, shift the dial, move, sort of facilitate the transition to more regenerative farming systems in the UK, uh, particularly around crop science, soil science, plant science. So we sort of set to work on trying to understand that uh, through this work that we've been doing. First of all, why do more research? So there might be you know, some people in the audience that say, oh, for goodness sakes, we've done, you researchers have had lots of money already. Don't, why do we need to do more research? Here are the five principles of Regen Ag that have been beautifully illustrated there by the Groundswell um, team, and we all know them. So don't we already know what we, what we need to do? Should we just get out there and do it, right? But I don't know if anyone in the room uh, can notice there's a sixth principle that sometimes it's not included in this diagram, but it is often mentioned in, in uh, Regen Ag circles. What's the sixth one that's missing there? Anyone know? Context. Context, right? Well done. Sorry, I reverted there a little bit to my lecturer. Sorry, I'll go back to my lecturer. Uh, so yeah, context. So it's all about applying those. These are great overarching principles. How do you apply those in, the, in our local context? And Regen Ag is really context uh, specific, right? Uh, you know, you're, when you start to remove inputs, you really then, the environmental factors, conditions on your farm really become more and more important. So we do need to do research in our local context. So what about, isn't this just good old fashioned mixed farming? Maybe we can just look at how we used to farm locally and, uh, and you know, just carry on with that. We don't need the research. Well, I guess I would argue, and most of us would argue that definitely there's been a lot of research in the past that is applicable, right? Around, before we even knew or used that word, Regen Ag. Um, and we definitely need to look at that and build on that. But we've also got lots of new research methods uh, techniques and there's new innovations available out there in the farming sector so we do need to look at some of these and how they might support the transition. So that's kind of how we justify that we probably do need to do more research around Regen Ag. So this project was about identifying where are the gaps in knowledge. It wasn't about actually finding out the answers to all these topics I'm going to put out in a minute but just what do, you know where have we put more effort in the past, where do we need more effort. So it's about what we did was we set out, first of all, to get a list of all the priorities around Regen Ag uh, and how to transition to Regen Ag based on talking to farmers and stakeholders, running a workshop, etc. Then we reviewed existing evidence around those priorities, so we looked at past projects, we looked at uh, peer-reviewed peer research, uh, old DEFRA reports, and based on that we just came up with the gaps. Basically, if you've got an important research topic, or challenge, and there hasn't been much research in the UK or much projects in the past, so there's a bit of a gap there, then that should be a top priority for us to maybe be focusing in on. So that was sort of our process, how we kind of ranked 
these different topics. So we came up with about 34 different topics, sometimes we call them challenges, uh, in these different theme areas, six different types of challenge or types of topic uh, that we thought would be important to address to uh, help transition to Regen Ag. And you can see them grouped there, I won't read through them all, but things like advice and guidance, how to do things, soil health, a big one, breeding, etc. So we went through that process that I mentioned of looking in the, at the evidence that's out there uh, and we uh, sort of reviewed that and talked to stakeholders at a workshop and tried to kind of decide which of these were higher priorities, etc. And we've just come out with a report is isn't yet publicly available that sort of talks about all 34 and the, con the, the status of research and where we think some of the gaps are and also how those, how those questions could be addressed. So I'm going to do a quick run through. I don't know how much time I got left. Probably rambled on. How am I doing? Am I okay, okay, okay. So here's some examples. Okay, so uh, impact of region ag on farm livelihoods. I think it's really interesting. I kind of find that um, reassuring, really, that through all of our research and discussions, this came out as really the top one, particularly at the re at the workshop. Basically, you know, how do you make it work economically on a farm? We need more evidence. Uh, from real farm situations who have implemented Regen Ag on how it's affecting their bottom line. Um, there aren't that many studies or projects right now that have been looking at that in the UK. I put a few up there on the screen that I think are really useful. Things like Fix Our Food, which is a uh, UK transforming the food systems project up in Yorkshire. There's Ruth Wade who has a field experiment uh, looking at Regen systems. Ni a lot of NIAB trials, like the STAR trial there, will provide lots of useful agronomic information on yields, uh, and also they provide economic sort of analysis of margins and stuff, so that's useful too. And you've got AHDB, strategic farms, monitor farms, so there's that sort of stuff going on. We need to probably consolidate that and sort of synthesize some of that information and build on that. So we need more sort of applied research knowledge exchange <coughs> around that question. Um, Regional adaptation of cover crops, so this is one that comes up again and again. This comes back to that context uh, issue, and I always get quite, kind of fired up about that because I come from North America, and I know if you take a cover cropping system that works in North America and try and do it here, it's a very different climate. So we need to look at uh, systems as well as the actual varieties of uh, species of cover crops that are going to work in UK rotations and systems knowing we've got sort of cool, wet, temperate climates. We don't have, it's hot now, but it takes, you know, it's quite late in the summer actually relative to the North America to get that hot weather that's going to maybe make it, um, you know, make your cover crop mature that you could roll or crimp it. It's probably a bit late. So those systems that are used in other parts of the world maybe are appropriate here. Not really any, many peer-reviewed studies. A bit of historical literature, so we can go back to some studies back even in the 90s on things like cover crops in the UK and make sure we build on that. Uh, I wanted to highlight the cover crop guide. You can see there, bottom left, that's a real farmer-led initiative. Angus Galthorpe up in Yorkshire got funding with Yorkshire Agricultural Society to produce this online resource that's really fantastic. I don't know if any of you have seen it yet. I believe AHDB is going to take that sort of within there, sort of as their, part of their they are sort of um, materials to maintain going forward. So lots of good practical information in that. We've got projects like Maya Center for uh, High Carbon Couch Cropping where they are looking at cover cropping. So there is some stuff going on, so we need to build on that. Um, in terms of the actual varieties, yeah, look at what the existing crop varieties are for among the cover crops uh, and work with the seed companies to, um, to basically sort of really select and identify those cover crops that are suited for our systems. Um, variety evaluation breeding for low end and pesticides, so that's one that comes up again and again that the varieties we're using haven't been selected for uh, regen systems. This is just one set of traits, there's other traits that came up in the review as well uh, that uh, there's a lot of interest in breeding for. Uh, so there are projects out there, things like uh, this NIAR project exploiting novel wheat genotypes, very relevant, there'll be a lot to learn from that. And we have our own ORC project, Live Seeding, where we trial modern wheat varieties compared to blends and uh, heterogeneous populations in organic systems. So really under sort of a high kind of selection pressure for uh, weed pressure and also low nitrogen and pesticides. So there are projects like that going on. Um, 
This really links with the recent HDB recommended list review. So this was also identified in that review of their um, of the sector as something of interest. And they've done a scoping study recently that definitely I think would be the first point of call to build on that if we're going to go forward and start to look at uh, variety evaluation uh, for these sorts of trades. Uh, intercropping is one of my favorites because if you go into the peer-reviewed literature, uh, which is an academic I love to do, hundreds of papers out there globally on how to intercrop. You know, it's something, it's not new, it's been going on around the world for years and years. But, uh, and there's also been some really important projects here in the UK. Um, and you'll see some on the screen there with people like Andrew Howard who did enough field on this a few years ago. We did lots of good work finding out what's going on globally and around and in the UK. We had this Diversify project, which was an ORC project, where they developed some tools, but more sort of applicable to European situations that could be adapted, uh, innovative farmers projects. And then you've got this leguminose, which I noticed actually, I think on the program here at Groundswell, I think there's something on the leguminose, I don't know if anyone here knows, this later this afternoon. So um, there is some stuff going on. We need more field trials with farmers, developing some practical recommendations. Uh, and regional demonstrations, that sort of thing. So that's another one that's quite high on the list. And oh, I also should mention, yeah, the bottom left, that's a soil association project, and they're part of Leguminose, which is also a university-ready project. So I'd certainly go to the Leguminose sort of group, first of all, to find out where they think the next steps are in research. And now here's a, here's a bit of a tricky one. Uh, around soil health, uh, this real tricky question around the pros and cons of st what we call strategic tillage. So as an organic farmer, um, as organic farmers are often sort of criticized for using the plow uh, from time to time, I think that many of them are really trying to reduce their use of tillage, but once in a while we'll want to go in and till. Likewise, conventional farmers, especially if they can't use glyphosate in the future, may want to occasionally till. So what are the negative effects of that, what we call strategic tillage, relative to continuing no-till at all, but using glyphosate, where there's a lot of concerns about that. So there's some stuff to unpick around relative effects of tilling occasionally versus glyphosate. There's lots of uh, papers globally on occasional tillage, nothing really done in, here in the UK. Lots of papers on glyphosate and soil health, but nothing really sort of looking at the trade-offs. I think there's a bit of work to do. Uh, around that. Um, here's a couple of projects that may start to look at that. So again, Ruth's project, Fix Our Food. Also, um, uh, the project, Jonathan Storkey's long-term trial at Rothenstead Research, where they're compar comparing uh, quite systematically regen versus um, sort of more conventional practices <coughs> may help us to start to unpick this, these questions. Uh, let's see, oh, I think I'm almost done. Am I in time? Good. Okay, yeah. So basically some of my, my thoughts really. There is a lot of extensive no uh, background knowledge on many of these challenges. I'm, I'm really not a fan of reinventing the wheel. It's been a lot of work done. So part of the benefit I think of this project we've just done is we really tried to compile sort of a, a database of all those projects on all these areas that have happened in the past. Um, so that we can kind of then look at that before we go forward in planning new, uh, new projects. So, you know, working groups around some of these priority areas to, form, to build strategies to sort of formulate new programs, I think, are what's needed. And, uh, yeah, so we can build on that information in the past <coughs> projects. And, uh, yeah, also working across these challenges and multidisciplinary methods are also really important. So I think that's everything I'm going to say for now. I'm going to hand over to Tom. Okay, thanks for having me. Thank you. <laughs> Great. So... Um, so I'm going to share what we found in a, in a complementary piece of work for this, which is looking at it from, from the other end of the way and, and looking at farmer research priorities. So when, when you ask farmers what they want research on, what you want research on, as far as in the audience as well, uh, what, what, what comes up? And um, so what's on people's minds? And as we've done a recent sort of snapshot of that with um, the NFU, Innovate UK, and a whole, whole lot of other groups involved as well. So. That's what I'm going to share, and what prompted it, to start with from our end, was a uh, joint research strategy that we put together for the agricultural universities. I mentioned this group of agricultural universities that get together as the agricultural universities council, and part of that's about seeing you know, where many hands can make light work and we can team up and do things 
together that we'd otherwise be, uh, be you know, deeply in the effort on. Um, and so part of that was looking at where our research effort goes at the moment and thinking about you know, are there ways we could, uh, we could um, uh, target that better and things were going to be more useful and relevant on the ground. Um, we resolved out of that process to do uh, a whole bunch of things, um, including training researchers to um, focus more on systems, but also to work more effectively with farmers on the ground. But we also had quite an emphasis on a more open priority setting, more open research priority setting. And so that was a problem for this. And behind that was we did lots of survey work and things, and we found that uh, farmers, but also researchers, felt that UK agricultural research was you know, fantastic, world class, and all that, but also poorly communicated, poorly coordinated, and, um, and out of touch with what farmers were needing on the ground. So that was the drive for this piece of work. Um, ultimately, we need, I think, probably much more um, sort of long term structural ways of building farmers' voices continuously into the ways that particularly funders and research providers, universities, institutes and so on, decide what to do and focus on. Um, we don't have that at the UK level. There's, in Scotland there's Safari which does a little bit of that um, uh, pretty effectively, but at the UK level that doesn't really happen so systematically. And this, what I'm sharing now, is not a long term, we're not pretending this sort of addresses that problem once and for all. It's a quick snapshot um, in the spirit of crappy on doing something that's better than, uh, better than just leaving it, um, leaving it alone. So that's the backstory to it. Is this yeah, there we go. Um, so last time anybody had done something much like this was back in 2013, where many of the same people, so the NFU, AIC, um, uh, Innovate, uh, then the Technology Strategy Board, I think it was called, released this Feeding the Future report, and that, um, that took an approach of talking to lots of groups of farmers and then putting their, their priorities together and presenting those back to the funders and research providers and it proved quite influential so it helped shape the agri-tech strategy that year which was a big spend um, on uh, big investment by government in, um, in agriculture which I'm sure lots of people have mixed feelings about it but this piece of work already made it better than it would have been um, and then it also shaped the transforming food production program which was the next sort of big wave of investment from, um, from government. So it proved quite an influential exercise. And um, we decided with NFU, with that same group uh, and Innovate UK who'd been involved in 2013, but also to bring in a more diverse range of farmers groups as well. So farmer networks, so Landworks Alliance and uh, uh, Innovative Farmers, Innovation for Agriculture. So we tried to sort of broaden out the range of systems that would rep be represented in this process to do a bit of a repeat of that. So we held 12. Um, 12 farmer workshops which were run by this uh, group of different farm networks um, with their own community, so the Agritech Centre as well um, uh, did some of that and like I mentioned, Network Alliance, um, Innovative Farmers and so on too, and AIC. So a real mix of farming systems, some ran multiple groups, some, uh, some just had, uh, had one session. 92 farmers and growers were involved in the process. And, um, and then you can see the commissioning group and the uh, funders there as well. All the groups then used a standard format to kind of pull together the lists of priorities that people came up with in those groups. And we, we tried to, um, to do a pretty cheap and cheerful version of this and, um, and see how far we get using chat GPT to do the thematic analysis. So like put a whole lot in there and see what came out. And actually worked a bit, uh, but not as well as we hoped. And so my colleague Kelly at the back there who, um, who's done much of this work, then went and manually uh, ran through and coded, coded all the um, all the priorities that came through against lots of different um, lots of different other sets of priorities, which I'll talk through in a moment. So we did a lot of shared work, and it was a huge amount of work in the end because because uh, the uh, chat GPT didn't, didn't come through. Um, and the um, the operating principles were we wanted to keep it simple, kind of. Not, not have us do it all in the centre, but let the, let the groups of farmers and those networks kind of run, run their own show, and like I say, be more inclusive of different systems and previous exercises, and also if, in some cases, like in horticulture, which we didn't go into a huge amount of depth in this, um, they, there's been a lot of thought already about sort of research priorities, so again, we didn't want to reinvent the wheel and, and get everybody to say again things they felt they'd said many times before, so we, we allowed a flexible approach to it. And, um, 
and then you can see here the sorts of things that we got from each group, and then we then we process. And the um, the way we then tried to make sense of what came through was to take those themes that I was suggesting, so lots of specific things, and then group them, and then map those against what other people were saying the research ought to be on. So we took the work that Julius just talked about now on regen research priorities, and we said, well, how, how, how does what we're hearing from farmers map onto those themes that Julia pulled out? Uh, we also looked at um, the uh, priorities of funders of BDSRC, the main research funders of agriculture in the UK, what they said the priorities were. We looked at the Agri-Food for Net Zero network, which has a stand over there, which is a big group of researchers working on, um, on agriculture and Net Zero. And they'd just gone through a process of thinking about research priorities, so we looked at how these ideas from farmers mapped onto what that group of researchers said was important. So we're trying to look at it in a way, sort of, from the ground up, and then uh, and then at the other, the other end of the telescope, for like other people sort of have, taking you know, strategic views on what they thought was important and seeing what matched up, what didn't. And then the final one on the uh, on the left there is the Agriculture Universities Council review of um, of strategy that I mentioned, where we looked through where not what people thought ought to be, hap be happening, but what research was actually going on. And so again, we compared what farmers wanted with what research was happening. So you can't read that. Don't worry about that. Um, I'll talk through roughly uh, roughly what's going on here. Um, so across the dozen workshops, farmers suggested 800-ish priorities, ideas, challenges, needs, and um, lots of specifics. And when we put this out in a few weeks' time, you'll be able to browse through and sort of go into all the detail on every specific idea that came up through that process. Um, some of them are fleshed out and you know expansive ideas. Some of them are you know one word, uh, one word suggestions. So they'll all they'll all be there. Um, but I just want to focus today on the main patterns. So. <coughs> Here at the top of the list, so the stuff with you know, big bars is where there were lots of suggestions, the things with only a few, where there were very few suggestions. Um, top of the list were points about how how research gets done, actually, so not what to research on, but about the adoption of ideas, about farm-led innovation, about future skills, changing skills around, around farming. Uh, then you get into a bunch of things around uh, disease detection, nutrient management, breeding, digital tools, and so forth. Then you get into soil health. Not that far down the list, and not much further actually. We get into things that are specifically about regenerative agriculture. Um, so that's regen as a kind of topic in its own right. Um, when we mapped the, uh, as I mentioned, the priorities that came through those 800 against the themes in, in Julia's report that she just ran through now, it's slightly earlier versions, so there's only five here rather than six. But, um, so we, we map them across those themes, and you can see down the left-hand side there are those themes, so how to at the top, and crop genetics, and farm behaviour, and so forth. Um, what we saw was about just over half of the things that had come through in this process, we could we could match up with one of those themes. So a bit under half didn't really fit anything to do with regen, and um, so there were suggestions around. So at the, at the right here is things where more suggestions came through under those themes um, within sort of clusters we group in. So people were interested in the impact of regenerative systems on the environment, in um, on the soils, in indicators of, of soil biology, soil, you know, soil health, um, uh, on the farm behaviour side of things, like what's stopping people doing more of this uh, was part of the interest. And research into that, breeding for uh, disease and insect tolerance, um, and, uh, and then on the how-to side of it, um, uh, a lot, a lot of uh, thinking about um, really research into how to change your system, integrate livestock back in, and also on cover crops, like you mentioned. So, a good, in a way, quite a good fit um, with the themes that you was highlighting. And then, um, what this one shows is, uh, so we haven't named these groups because we thought that was a bit, a bit unfair. But um, what it shows is the different networks, so some of the groups like NFU run a whole bunch of workshops and, and some of the networks just run one workshop. This is by which network can be the workshops and in the turquoise is the, the, the things that came up that weren't about regenerative agriculture and what this shows is basically all the groups across the board, whatever systems they're working with, whoever was there, they all were pretty interested in regen. Some of them very interested in it, some of them, some of them less so, but it wasn't like it was one or two groups 
that you know sort of usual suspects if you like talking about this it was across the board and that was that was interesting as well um, we also uh, we also looked at what had changed since that 2013 report so it's been quite a long 10 years in a way since then so we we looked at under the themes back from 2013, what had kind of gone up and what had gone down, uh, and some of the things. So this isn't all the themes from there, um, but under there was a big theme around precision ag back in 2013. Still very much on people's minds, but quite a different shift. So it was stuff back then on uh, animal health and handling, handling perishability. The things that were on people's minds under that theme now were more about data ownership and connectivity and those sorts of things on um, e uh, ecosystem services and so on, which was a big theme back then. Uh, interested in back then plant genetics and for, for green for greenhouse gas mitigation and so on. Now much more focus on sort of wider landscape features and hedgerows and sort of getting out of the field um, in that area. Uh, on social science, it was about how do you um, you know, back then it was about in a way, anticipating elms and, and the design of these systems, which ones work, which ones don't. Now, again, sort of more expansive view perhaps on, um, on ways to incentivize farmers to um, get the goods beyond, sort of beyond, uh, beyond what's now familiar in terms of elms and kind of what a farmer, farmer, really, farmer's relationships with the wider public as well. And on training. Right, then a big focus on demonstration um, and um, sort of demo farms and so on now, much more farmer involvement in research, so sort of taking taking out of out of even demo farms out there uh, everywhere and also farm wellbeing, much bigger theme. Um, I mentioned the Agri-Food for Net Zero Network Plus there, um, so in a way, just briefly on that, quite a good fit with some of the big themes around food security and so on um, that were identified in that process, where Farmers weren't suggesting so much around circular food systems, so things like waste valorization, um, behaviour change, public behaviour change, and healthy and sustainable diets, which isn't really a surprise because those things are, are several steps removed from uh, from what farmers might be dealing with every day. But obviously, in the sort of medium term, have massive uh, massive effects on the future of farming and uh, the viability of different production systems and so on. Uh, comparing with funder priorities, so these are the headings that the BBSRC has identified to main um, uh, research council funding, agricultural research, and identified as particularly important. And here, it was a bit of a mixed fit, so lots on what they grouped as sustainable agri-systems, um, a bit on uh, crop and animal health and precision. And then genomics, a very big focus for the BBSRC, less of a theme present, but not such a big theme for farmers. And then the other things on um, reducing waste and food safety and nutrition, same applies as what I said a moment ago. And um, the final, I'm going to share that we compared with this is again hard to see, but there's some big patterns here to mention. Um, what we did here was the, the pale, the yellow, which is which is you know, lots of yellow on the left and not very much yellow on the right. That is mapping basically where the research is happening, um, looking back uh, where it has been happening uh, across the universities and the whole sector, and. The way we did that was we took the 3,000 <coughs> publications that as a group of universities we put into the last big review of what we're all up to, which is called the REF, and we went and looked at what those were all about, and then we counted how many of them were about different topics. Uh, and then in the orange is doing the same, but for the 800 or so current PhDs that are going on in the way culture across the country. So we did those, we, we grouped them on the themes, uh, and then in the red, are uh, under the same headings the farming research priorities for this process. And so what we've done is saying, are, are, are people doing research where farmers want research? And the answer is a little bit sometimes. So here, the areas where most of the research effort has been going have very little uh, interest in farmers. That's, and that's because they're basic science, basic plant science, basic science that you know, the, is several steps removed from farming, but that's where the majority of the published research effort is going. Then you've got a, um, a set of things where there's a reasonably good, uh, good fit. Um, and uh, so that's on applied livestock research, applied plant, uh, applied plant science, and, um, as, uh, and also, uh, I'm not going to read it myself, <laughs> uh, but also uh, yeah, sort of applied ecosystem uh, environmental science as well. So good fit there. Lots of interesting farmers, quite a lot of research going on. And then you've got the things where farmers want a lot, 
uh, in this process at least. And Thank you guys. I think that was a really good introduction and should set us up for having a potentially interesting conversation. You could shout at them because they've missed something out. You can challenge them on their interpretation. You can do whatever you like. This is your bit of the session. There is a roving mic. We do want you to use it so that the questions are captured. Can you also please introduce yourself when you, before you ask a question, again, so that um, we might understand perhaps some context or background that's really important to us. Um, basically, put your hands up. The Reverend Mike will find you, and it will just literally seek you out. I'm not in control, so I'm not going to point. It's, it's in control, and when you have it, please feel free, and it's probably just easier for me if you stand up, because that means I can see you, if you're happy to do that, with the Reverend Mike and speak. No, you don't do nothing at all. Hi, everybody. Hi, Tom. Nice to see you. Hi. Um, that was super interesting. Thank you so much. Lots to talk about with you afterwards. I just want to ask, where in this do you... F is it in here, kind of the hard science of what the world really needs versus then farmers' priorities based on what they're seeing, researchers' funds, etc. Is that kind of in the, re the funders and, and other priorities? Where, where do we sort of match it, all of that against what we've actually got to achieve in a time frame. Cool. Yeah. I'll let him answer and think about it, but I need you to introduce yourself. Oh, sorry, I'm Geraldine uh, Gilbert. I'm Geraldine Gilbert from Forum for the Future. Thank you. Do you want to? Yeah. 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 Uh, so, so in a way, this is one ingredient this, and, and, and into that kind of that kind of thought process, and um, I might, might take one of this. What would be useful would be uh, a bit like what what happens in Scotland through the Safari Network, which is every few years the research institutes and the, and the Scottish Government, the main um, national research funder, get together and, and sort of do a proper, have a proper think about what might be useful to spend money on, where the research capacity is needed, and so on. And that and that involves kind of all the elements. So this kind of stuff, where you're going and talking to talking to farmers and other people involved in doing things about what they find useful, what's on their plates, what ideas they have, where they need backup, and so on. But also doing the sort of you know that the, the the big picture stuff, saying where's the world heading, you know what what is is this enough, and looking at it from you know at least both those dimensions and probably other things as well, and and doing that together. So you don't have it's not all about a um, you know sometimes. The way the research funding works is it's almost sort of fire and forget. So people come up with this idea of, you know, well, let's have let's have a, some research on this topic and then put it out there and hope that a competitive process will will deliver the optimal way to solve that problem. And generally, it doesn't. Um, so we all run around and um, uh, and um, don't necessarily use our, uh, our energy as, um, as as effectively as we could collectively. Um, so so I think something like that, where it's you know deliberate planned, regular, strategic look at what's important, that's, that's, it doesn't, um, doesn't yeah, necessarily end up with it, it being perfect, but it's much, much better than the way we do things come over to the UK level. So I think that's what we need, and this is, like I say, one, one ingredient, not the whole answer. So June is going to comment, but can you wave if you want to ask the next question, because then the microphone will find you as Julia talks. Yeah, I think like, as Tom's explaining, your, your research was very much about re farmer priorities, what was coming from there, and it was really reassuring to us and it, they, just by chance, these two projects were happening in parallel, but that your priorities map quite well onto the, what we came up with priorities, which was not just from farmers, but also talking to uh, scientists. I forgot to mention, when I was talking about what we did, as well as running a workshop with some stakeholders, there was also a great conference held in Cambridge in March um, uh, that was called The Future of Farming, where we had all kinds of people from all, you know, range of sectors, you know, um, non-governmental, non farmers, scientists, uh, all kinds of people together kind of really brainstorming again on these ideas of what we need to do really to to shift the dial. So um, yeah, and so you, you need to bring a lot of voices into the into the room really, and, but we've tried to do that with these two processes I think, uh, but there's still more work to do for sure. Hi, uh, Richard Winspear from RSPB. Yeah. <laughs> um, when you were uh, asking farmers about their challenges and needs, did you present them with a, a list to rank, which might make it, make it easier to um, prioritise the priorities, or 
or did you actually allow them a free choice, which might have given you the, the greater breadth of their priorities and needs? So, so the, the free choice, but with some, with some prompts, and part of the, the prompts were more about thinking far ahead, and you know, sort of getting out of what's on my mind this morning kind of thing, which is often where a conversation like that would start, and trying to help, help the conversations focus on, you know, 10 years and more ahead. Um, and so it's more that kind of prompt rather than saying, you know, which of these, uh, which of these five things that I think are important do you think are more important? <laughs> so, yeah, that's the idea. But it's, you know, you could, have a, you could have a process where you took a whole bunch of, you know, priorities that other people had put lots of thought into and said, you know, rank these and what we missed. So, but we didn't do it that way this time. Yeah, and we, we, uh, we did it more the way you're describing. I mean, we did, we did sort of very rapidly talk to various kind of key informants in the sector and came up with a list. Uh, and then we ran a workshop with some stakeholders and they sort of ranked to prioritize them, but they also told us the ones they thought that we'd missed, so we added to that list. So it was a bit of an iterative process. So I'm fairly confident that by now the various people have inputted into that our list, I'm fairly confident we haven't missed something or something obvious. <laughs> I guess the thing to comment from, from our perspective from that, that study was we were focused on plant science and soils, yeah. so they're all probably de more detailed livestock topics that probably aren't showing up in that that presentation we've given you. That isn't because we don't we don't think livestock are important, but just because the way that work was was funded and focused was more on that plant science, forage crops, but feeding through. You had the broader focus on all farming systems. Hi, cool. Uh, my name is Joy Skipper. I'm a registered nutritionist. Um, we've talked about what the farmers' needs are. From a nutritionist point of view, we obviously need nutrition um, for the general public. Are there many research papers or any studies going on that look at that from the other side, really? It actually came up as, it is one of the topics, uh, I think it's in two different places on our list. One of them around this topic of, nutri or of nutritional quality or nutrient density, which is quite a trendy sort of phrase to use these days. Um, so there are, yeah, so that's something to look at there. I mean, it's, this is all, probably could be too long of an answer, but you know, yeah, reg, I mean, region ag, dif, first of all, how do you do a study when it's not very clearly defined? That becomes a bit tricky. There's been a lot on organic food, comparing organic and conventional. There's a lot of that there on that, but on regen systems, not so much, so that might be considered a gap. Um, but another place where that sort of quality of the product came up was also uh, how it might affect the wider food system in terms of um, changing you know, the final fate of a given product. So if you have a product that uh, isn't lower quality necessarily, but let's say you have a, a grain that's lower in protein, a wheat that's lower in protein, uh, would no longer be used for maybe in the bread market, it might need to go into the feed market, what are the knock-on effects of that. So that did come up as something important more from the researchers and that's all around food systems, kind of really looking at food systems stuff and that transforming UK food systems talk call that you mentioned, those projects that are kind of getting to the end now, we're supposed to be addressing some of those questions. And so some of them have started to look at that. Uh, I'm sure there's more, more to look at in that topic area for sure. Uh, hi, is this working? Can you hear me? Yeah, hi, I'm Rob Booth from the British Ecological Society. Uh, I appreciate that the presentations were a very small encapsulation of the project, but I was wondering if maybe the discussion of climate change or extreme weather was missing a little bit. I wonder if you could reflect on what's going on. I wonder if you could reflect on how that kind of non-linear potential change will mediate how we do research in this kind of space, and if that at all sort of was involved in how you're conceptualising these, these future trajectories for research. Thank you. Um, so, and then you're talking there about, as in climate change, sort of more on the adaptation side than on the mitigation side, yeah. Um, and there's quite a lot, there's quite a lot going on around that, thinking about, you know, future crops and, and, and so on. There's some quite big projects trying to, uh, trying to explore that already. In terms of where, it, you know, in, in the piece of work I mentioned, it didn't, um, didn't come that up that much from, from the conversation with farmers was a big theme. Um, uh, where and that, that agri-food net zero network 
I mentioned, within there it's part of the mix, although that's more focused on mitigation, but it's also, you can't, you know, it's sort of this, 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 the, this the changing scenery in a way, it's like, you know, the, 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 um, the, the moving, uh, moving backdrop to the whole thing, so it features within there, and also we, we, we did that exercise of looking where the overlap was, but yeah, it didn't come through as a huge, um, huge theme for the scholars. I think from our, um, uh, from, yeah, from our workshop, some of those questions that we've kind of grouped them under what we call wider system considerations, they might fall under that. So for instance, impacts on water cycle of region egg. So that's, it doesn't explicitly say climate adaptation, but the idea that, you know, regenerative systems might create, be more resilient in future <coughs> extreme weather, whether it's drought or excess, uh, excess moisture. Um, so that came up. Uh, and then questions around, yeah, around more climate, climate change uh, mitigation. So the questions around emissions are there as well relative emissions from different systems. And then if you look at the how-to bits, you know, crop rotation designs in there, and to me that's sort of, again, linked, you know, how do you design rotations for future, you know, be resilient in future, um, um, you know, future extreme climates. So it's in there, but not so explicit, you're right. It's not so explicit. Yeah, and also, sorry, because you uh, sort of reminded me, I think actually there were, there were, there was quite a bit in there around, <laughs> Resilience and yeah, particularly around around um, around drought and um, uh, and, and so on. So it was it was it was there. And also, when you're talking about about regen, I think it is part of the it's part of the overall sort of narrative and story. It's you know, part of the, the framing assumption is not only about um, about reducing impact and and, you know, and improving profitability and so on, but also about resilience and adaptation and you know and. Uh, and you know, herbal lays, for example, you know, deep rooting, and you know, how they do drought, and all, the, all those things are part of the part of the whole the whole um, the whole premise, almost. So I think they they've been that too. Hi, Ruth Ray from the University of Leeds. Thank you very much for the uh, shout out about our work that we're doing at the University of Leeds. Um, I just wanted to also make a comment that. Uh, as a researcher, in the last year I put in several grants uh, applications for research that is farmer-led, co-designed questions that they want to ask and it doesn't get funded. So I think there's another conversation to have and also another side to your work that you've done where we are trying but then it doesn't get funded, you know, so that, that's really difficult. And then the other question I just had for Julia, um, amazing work, and I really love that you've summarised some of the research that's going on. Is there, is there a future planning to continue this? Of the, the research that's going to be carrying on in the future, and how do we keep track of that, and how, how do they carry on forwards? Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, Ruth. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we were sort of built, we built a, da a database of sort of all these projects, you know, going back to the 90s, sometimes from DEFRA that are relevant, we think. So So that's sort of bare static right now, but it'd be great if it could be maintained and kept live and also sort of hosted somewhere. So uh, we're, we're sort of, at the moment, just thinking about what the next steps are, really, with that with that work. Um, yeah, I forget, was there another? Oh, about the, about the funding for farmer-led. Yeah, challenging. I think that comes back. Maybe you have something can to say. I, right? Can I just comment on um, the Farming Innovation Programme? We'll have a new big round of funding coming in the autumn, which is going to be called ADOPT, which is specifically focused on farmers, particularly working in collaboration, developing and enabling research up to £400,000. So a significant investment per project and quite a lot of millions. Now, this is farmers' own money. Let's be clear, in the Farming Innovation Programme, this is the repurposing of basic payment money, so farmers really working with researchers such as Ruth and others as facilitators, this will be a really brilliant opportunity, I think, to bring many of these things into action over the next year, year and a half, two years, really to step change the way we think about how we do this sort of research, and I think if it goes well, Tom, we'll have a really good case to keep doing research in that sort of way as part of a, a standard programme. Just going to put in a pitch now. Yeah, pitch, yeah. A pitch for uh, there's a, there's a conference coming up this autumn um, uh, that's co-hosted by Organic Research Centre Land Workers Alliance um, and the AAB. It's called Cultivating Wisdom, and it is all about uh, farmer-led, farmer sort of collaborative participatory research activities. So we're trying to bring together farmers and researchers in equal number to get together and talk about how they've worked together on what's worked for them in these farmer-led research 
uh, approaches. And uh, I think, uh, Philip, is, there's flyers around that you can just put that in your diary. It's in October, and we're looking for people to come along, and hopefully that'll be a really useful event. Cool. So I'm going, I've got one there, and I'm going to finish here, if that's okay. Hi there, um, Anthony Pierce from uh, North Shropshire Farming Regeneration League there. Um, I'm a historian and I'm very aware of the wealth of documentary evidence there is about 18th century and 19th century farming practices and I'm wondering whether there are people out there plundering this uh, wealth of evidence uh, for the benefit of informing uh, regenerative farming practices. I think the answer is probably not well enough um, but um, certainly People like me keep going, well, the Romans did work on grazing um, wheat to, to manage disease coming into the spring. And so, so actually this looking at what worked well in the past with the lens of thinking that through with a scientific framework and what we know now can actually generate really good new knowledge to be tested then in new systems. And I think that's a, it, it's a really good shout and something that I think what we've got lazy is where things have been digitised and we go, yeah, we'll search the literature. And what we mean is, we'll go back and look at what was published in the stuff that we can see digitally, not the stuff that we have to actually go to libraries and read and, and look properly, even at farm records and all sorts of things. I think there's a really good field there, really good opportunities, and it would be great, I think, to, for, for many of us, I think, to find those opportunities to take that forward. Um, I'm Claire Birch, I'm a trustee of Aurora Trust and I'm also a farmer and I happen to do my dissertation as a geographer on 18th century farming in Lincolnshire, so <laughs> very long time ago. Um, I was really interested, Tom, that you didn't have, um, given the fact that um, regenerative farming is struggling, they've only got either heritage grains or they're working with grains that have basically been designed to work in high input systems, I was surprised that research into crop varieties wasn't higher up on the list of interest for farmers. Yeah, um, uh, I think it, it was it was in there, but as you say, maybe not not um, uh, not as high as you might expect. I think uh, it, it's, a, it's quite a big theme in your piece of work. But the um, you know suitable varieties for um, for regenerative and agricultural systems. I think it, I think it's you know, it's, it's on people's minds. Yeah, I mean it uh, didn't come through as a huge thing. Maybe that also reflects that. Um, you know, variety is only sort of part of the part of the equation in a way, and we have you know, we have in UK agricultural science we've had this huge focus on crop varieties and breeding and that you know that being the you know the main thing, and um, so while it is hugely important, it's also quite refreshing to have the, the breadth of other yeah, yeah. yeah. But they're not designed for no, 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 sure, but I, but I think it's but I think it's also quite refreshing to have the um, I guess the attention. All the other things that matter as well to do with farm management and so on, and so yeah, I agree it's important. But I did, I, I think you, you may have maybe spotted when I was flying through, AHDB did a, did a bit of a survey of their, their um, levy pairs around the recommended list trials and what they wanted to see, and, and some of those questions have come up and I've totally forgotten. One of them was on reduced nitrogen, uh, and was this other one on pesticides? NIAB's done the scoping, been involved in those scoping studies? Is those two topics they've done? Yeah. So um, they have been looking at whether there's a need, and that's the big question of that sometimes differences of opinion among, um, among the scientists and the, the farmers on whether you need sort of new separate breeding programs or whether the breeding programs that select for the best uh, varieties under high nitrogen will also select the best under low, and that's the big kind of Holy Grail is is that still is yet to be resolved, really. Yeah, yeah and I think that there is work evaluating a whole range of varieties going back into the 40s to the modern varieties, barley and wheat particularly. I think the bigger challenge, actually, and that is in Julia's report, is actually for things that aren't those main cereals. Is for potatoes. Is for what? How do those other crops, and including minor cereals and spelts and, and so on, how do might the the and it's variety evaluation, not only breeding, but how is that process of looking at that whole range of genetic resources looked at and built ideally, I think, into diverse crops, not into single monocrops. And that also is a challenge, but one that's a huge challenge for all of us. So, two minutes to go. What I want a quick sense of is, did they get it about right or are they missing really key things? And the way you're going to tell me this is, because I've given you a couple of minutes, is if you think they're missing really key things, you need to come and tell them. So before you let them leave the stage, come and tell them. So that the number of people coming forward to go, but my things are on there, 
And actually, it's really important that if you've thought that, that you do do that. But otherwise, thank you for your attention, for your reflection, and for most of you, for your participation in these processes to date, and your continued engagement with us to think about what kind of research would really help you in future, so that we can do, as scientists, the best research to enable regen farming systems to deliver the food and environmental outcomes that we need. Thank you very much.